Another way to look at the uh, purpose of a platelet's life in a linear, sequential, logical order of events is that the first thing a platelet does when it grows up uh, to play its role in coagulation is to adhere to the extracellular matrix by virtue of the fact that the endothelial cell has been disrupted. There is then secretion of ADP and thromboxane A2 uh, from the granules of the platelet and this exposes phospholipid complexes uh, which now enable the platelet to express tissue factor and as you know tissue factor triggers off the extrinsic coagulation cascade ultimately uh, resulting in the uh, primary plug of uh, aggregated platelets becoming the secondary plug by virtue of the fact that this is now being straight strengthened by fibrin. So that's how you go from platelet to blood clot. And well, we cannot escape the classical coagulation cascade. So uh, let's talk about it. Uh, if you remember, there's an intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway is much more direct and much more powerful. The extrinsic has a lot more steps, starting out with factor 12. Uh, and it's also called the contact pathway. Uh, the extrinsic fac uh, pathway is called the tissue factor pathway. And it's a series of proenzymes being converted into enzymes by virtue of the fact that their predecessors have become enzymes which convert uh, the next generation of proenzymes into enzymes. The ultimate result or the uh, penultimate result which means the second to the last result is a conversion of prothrombin which is factor 2 into thrombin which is factor 2a and finally thrombin then ultimately changes fibrinogen which is factor 1 uh, fibrin, which is factor 1A. There's a whole bunch of cofactors. Uh, calcium is one. Phospholipids are essential from platelet membranes. And uh, there's a whole bunch of vitamin K dependent factors uh, made in the liver, like 2, 7, 9, and 10, which you just remember rotely, if you can't remember it any other way. And other uh, proteins or factors like uh, uh, protein S, protein C, protein Z primarily acting as uh, anti-coagulants uh, or checks on this whole cascade. And you know you're going to get the chart now. And uh, we're going to see it again as well and again somewhere else along the line. And, uh, you know, at some point in time, you're just going to have to know this. So let's know it now. And there might be better charts, but this is my favorite one. Your intrinsic pathway starts out when there's damaged surface and therefore factor 12 goes to activated factor 12 and then activated factor 12 activates factor 11 into activated factor 11 and then activate factor 11 then converts factor 9 into activated factor 9 which by the way when combined with factor or activated factor 8 then finally converts factor 10 into factor 10A. And if you think we're getting towards the end, we are, because then factor A converts prothrombin into thrombin, and then thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin. And of course, fibrin can then become cross-linked. Uh, and uh, that's the complicated pathway. You should remember it. That's the intrinsic, the extrinsic fac factor pathway. The extrinsic pathway is uh, initiated by tissue factor, which is more direct and more powerful. And tissue factor, we remember, we said was made by platelets, endothelial cells, traumatized tissue. So in the uh, extrinsic pathway, factor seven is converted into factor 7a activated and that has a direct effect now 
on factor 10 again to convert it to factor 10a, rather than going to three more steps like we saw here on the intrinsic pathway. If you look at the red arrows, these are all areas uh, which act as a check on coagulation. So when you hear that protein C is an anticoagulant, you know it's going to have some effect on the conversion of factor 5 to factor 5a and factor 8 to factor 8a here in the intrinsic side. You know antithrombin, sometimes called antithrombin 3, has an effect on con activating factor 10 as well as a, a direct effect preventing the formation of thrombin. If TFPI, tissue factor pathway inactivator, uh, has its main effect on factor on and the conversion of factor 7 to activated factor 7. Uh, I don't think there's any way to make this chart fun or easy. Uh, I guarantee you, you should really know all the main players. There's a lot more. It could have been a lot harder. Uh, we'll come back to it again. Uh, let's also try to make coagulation testing as easy as we can as well. Uh, in the old days, we called something PTT and PT. And PTT was generally a test to measure the intrinsic pathway, and PT was the extrinsic. And because the intrinsic pathway is the thing that needed measured for patients on heparin therapy, you got a PTT test for patients on heparin, or uh, oral, I'm sorry, intravenous anticoagulation. Now they call it APTT for activated. The uh, PT is now called INR, unfortunately. Uh, that's the same concept as the prothrombin time, uh, and that measures the extrinsic. Make a long story short, you got patients on heparin, you get yourself a PTT, partial thromboplastin time activated, APPT, APTT. Patients on Coumadin, oral anticoagulants, you measure the extrinsic system, and you measure their normalized prothrombin time, which is called INR. Another really good general and often screening test for coagulations, everybody gets it anyway in the hospital, is just to remember uh, the platelets. And the uh, platelet count is normally about 150 to 400,000. It varies. And if you have a bleeding time, uh, which is normally from two to nine minutes, that's a test of platelet number and function. If you have a normal number of platelets, but an abnormal bleeding time, it means your platelets probably aren't working too well. And you know what this two to nine minutes is. It means how long you could keep blotting blood from a small cut. And if you could still blot after nine minutes, it's an elevated bleeding time. You can also measure the end product uh, or the second to the last end product of coagulation, fibrinogen, that can be consumed in a lot of hemorrhagic processes. Uh, and remember, if you have to, you could measure almost just about any one of those factors that we talked about if you suspected a specific factor assay. In clinical medicine, you're really going to be using your uh, APTT, your INR, your platelet count, and uh, your bleeding time for most common uh, coagulation uh, tests. Okay, let's open the door to thrombosis and then deal with it in the next 10 minutes. Uh, we talked about, uh, let's talk about the pathogenesis of thrombosis, uh, at the role of endothelial injury, the role of alterations in blood flow, the role of hypercoagulability, what blood clots look like, their fate, clinical correlations, and venous versus arterial blood clots. And we'll deal with that next, and I thank you very much for now.